Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the last panel of uh, the day uh, for today. Uh, thank you very much for staying uh, with us. Uh, the uh, session today is on digital masculinities. Uh, and I think some of the most interesting titles that I've seen in, in the session so far. So we'll have papers on Cannibal Daddy, how did Twitter users negotiate masculinity, kink, and abuse in the wake of Army Hammer's leaked uh, DMs. Um, we'll have another on re-articulating the idea of the manosphere, what subgroups as digital idiot culture and not idiot culture as I first read it. And uh, we'll end uh, with the most uh, tantalizing title, I think, of the day. So British lads hit each other with chairs, uh, viewership, speculation, and male affection. So that'll be the, the running order for the session uh, today. And we will begin uh, with uh, Jaime Garcia Iglesias and uh, Neta Jodovic. Uh, Jaime holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Manchester and is Mildred Baxter postdoctoral fellow at the University of Edinburgh, where he explores the relationship between sexual fantasies, internet and health. And Dr. Neta Jodovic is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Haifa, studying cultural policy in a research project funded by Horizon uh, 2020. Uh, so Jaime and Neta, over to you. One second. Um, is Jaime here? <laughs> yes. I can see him. I'll, we'll just wait for him to share the slides and then we'll start, if you don't mind. Sorry, I was having an issue with um, sharing the screen. But here it is. And we can begin. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today, and thank you for the very lovely introduction. Um, so as was already said, my name is Neta Jodovic. I'm here accompanied by my colleague, Jaime Garcia Iglesias, and today we will discuss uh, the presentation about um, Cannibal Daddy, how do Twitter users negotiate kink, abuse, and memes. And before we begin, uh, we would like to um, include a trigger warning uh, because this presentation will include um, discussion and, um, and content relating to sexual and physical abuse. So please, you have been warned. Um, off to Jamie. So uh, as many of you may know, Armie Hammer is an American actor who's best known for his role in movies such as The Social Network or Call Me By Your Name from 2018. In that movie, Call Me By Your Name, alongside actor Timothy Chalamet, he depicts a homosexual summer fling. Um, the film makes or made of Armie Hammer a kind of homoerotic icon, despite his being heterosexual in his everyday life. In early January 2021, so just a few months ago, a number of women came out on social media and shared the screenshots of conversations they had had with Armie Hammer, um, who was at the time married, explaining that they had been in BDSM sexual relationships with him. Those relationships, they said, had turned from consensual BDSM to uh, abuse and gaslighting over the period of several months. Um, in those conversations, Army Hammer is seeing or read as talking about himself as a cannibal and narrating numerous sexual fantasies of extreme sexual violence against those women. We expose Adud's conceptualization of this event as a sort of a scandal because it had ubiquitous media presence. It was a social phenomenon with unique salience. And what we can see here um, in the lower part of the screen is that there was a massive spike in Google searches for Ami Hammer around early 2021 as this scandal unfolded. Um, he trended all over the world, most like uh, most frequently with the hashtag Army Hammer Scandal or Army Hammer Cannibal. And why did we want to study the case of Army Hammer? Um, what we look at this presentation, first of all, is not so much the content of the of the messages or the supposed allegations of abuse, 
but the reaction to those messages being leaked online and how people talked about them, discussed their feelings around them, and kind of made sense of the whole scandal. When we started this conversation, our expectations was that we would go online and find people engaging in conversations around what was kink, what was BDSM, and what was abuse, and what was the line between all those practices. Something similar to what happened after the Fifty Shades of Grey books and movies were released, where a conversation happened online about what, where were the limits between BDSM and abuse. We also thought we would find people discussing notions of masculinity and sexuality, most commonly because Hammer's homoerotic appeal is very different to his supposed heterosexual um, everyday life and marriage at the time, and that we would find users using humor in those discussions of a sexual controversy. Um, but we were really, really wrong. So the findings that we will discuss today are preliminary and part of the first step of our analysis. Um, to examine the discourse on the Army Hammer scandal on the Twitter sphere, we have scraped all tweets using the hash hashtag Army Hammer since the day the story broke out, which was 9th of January 2021, until 9th of March 2021, meaning we scraped the tweets posted in the first two months of the scandal. The search produced 11,129 uh, 11, tweets. As part of our preliminary research and for the purpose of today's presentation, we chose to focus on the top 100 tweets based on the number of likes they received. Um, we wanted to see which tweets received the most traction and were positively accepted by fellow users as expressed through likes. To ensure the anonymity of the users, the examples we will use today will not feature users' names or profile pictures. By using grounded approach, we identified six emergent categories of the tweets. We found tweets referencing to call me by your name, tweets that called out abuse, we found expressions of shock, tweets that focused on Hammer's celebrity status, and we also found tweets um, of fans that wanted to defend Hammer. A number of those tweets did not fit any of our primary categories. And in addition, we also coded all the tweets uh, from all categories as yes and no for humor. Yes, so once we had identified that humor was a key element in people's responses to the scandal on Twitter, we were interested in looking at what was the nature and content of that humor. Was it some sort of feminist humor that called out the structural inequalities that had made those supposed um, abusive relationships possible? Was it shock at and yet another white man being accused of sexually abusing young women? Or was it anti-feminist humor perhaps that supported Army Hammer and shamed the supposed victims? Well, in reality, it was hardly neither of those. What we saw was that the vast majority of humorous responses were articulated around shock. Shock at the, by the users, at the news, and the content of the messages. For example, we have this tweet that features Dr. Um, Phil and uh, jokes about the need to uh, spend a lot of time researching the Army Hammer controversy alongside another controversy of the time, which is the Britney Spears conservatorship. This tweet that jokes about having to cleanse your eyeballs with holy water after reading those messages and finding out why Army Hammer was trending at the time. That with a very shocked Matteo from the Superstore Netflix series. Or this one that compares Army Hammer with Jeffrey Hammer and makes a reference to the Come By Your Name movie. And what they do in general um, is what they are separating the scandal from the larger context in which it happened. Despite all the tweets happening in the Me Too era, and we've been used at reading examples of men abusing women in the Hollywood industry time and again, the shock expressed through these, through these tweets and the memes depicts the scandal as an abnormal story, as a shocking outlier story to the larger context in which it takes place. They separate the scandal from the structural background of inequalities that's a heteropatriarchy that allows it and focus not so much on the abuse, but on the arguably kinky sexual practices that are narrated 
on the messages and joke about them, giving little attention to the implications that those messages may have had for the victims. In her paper about Twitter reactions to the Me Too era, Anderson found that some social media users joked about who from Weinstein's victims were fuckable and which ones were not. In some unparalleled fashion, Twitter users found R. Mihammer fuckable and joked about his behavior to realizing it. And an example, a prime example of that is this tweet in which the, he is defined as a cannibal daddy, which gives the, gives the title to a presentation. There are generally three main theories of humor um, that kind of argue about what is the uh, why, when, and how we use humor. Those are divided in theories of incongruity, relief, and superiority. In this research, we argue that Twitter users use mostly humor as a relief mechanism, relieving the pressure that arises from the shock at the structural norms being broken, in this case, Army Hammer being depicted as a, or self-depicted as a sort of cannibal um, who's really into BDSM practices and potentially abuse. We can also see examples of humor being used as a superiority mechanism because in users joking about their reaction, how shocked they are, they are placing themselves as individuals outside um, such controversial uh, kings as if they were not to partake in those practices. As we have previously suggested, the case of Army Hammer seems detached from other high profile Me Too cases through these, um, through these tweets. While the cases, for example, of Harvey Weinstein promoted a global call for action against abuse and harassment, Twitter did not uh, take the same approach with Army Hammer and rather focused on the juicy details of the sexual practices and not on the structural content in which they happened. Given this, we still need to ask um, whereas whether these humorous stance that Twitter users took meant that they were not interested in the politics of um, the scandal and abuse, or whether they were uh, interested and this humor played a political role. And to do that, we refer to the idea of homology and effective homophily. Homology is a classical sociological term, um, which is an attempt to understand the formation of friendships and communities based on similarity of values. But we really like how Pazan defines that in Who's Laughing Now, which is a very recent book, in which they say that affective homophily is the coming together of people through expressions of similar feelings. We argue that the memes, far from discussing the abuse allegations and the structures that made them possible, focus on the kink and juicy details producing uh, and the shock producing the reader and therefore create an affective homophily. And we structure this based on Rabin's 1984, Thinking Sex and the Charmed Circle of Sexuality. What we can see through these memes is that in their shock, these users are positioning Army Hammer on the very outlier um, area of this circle of sexuality as a very outcast, as something which is very deviant, very out there. But in doing so, and emphasizing their shock at those practices, they are at the same time placing themselves in that very center of the circle of sexuality as the um, shock, naive, vanilla victim of these um, tweets and revelations that they are seeing online. They are doing it at the same time, they are pushing out the perverted and placing themselves in the firmly acceptable. We witness in so doing a clear regressive moral pattern uh, in this humor, a sense of pearl clutching, not at the abuse itself, but at the juicy details um, that come from the messages. They render the case as isolated and as a single uh, one of incident and the acts that took place and, and as unspeakable that forced them to wash their eyes with holy water after reading about them. In a way, with some tweets uh, and turtles, we have gone from Army Hammer being a cannibal daddy to a pearl clutching moral majority uh, that leads to a conservative regressive attitude through the humor in Twitter. So to conclude, the case of Army Hammer is unusual in the Me Too landscape. Unlike Ar Harvey Weinstein or Louis CK, Army Hammer was and perhaps still is a sex icon and a prominent and popular figure in the gay community. 
Thus, he received a different treatment from the audience when allegations regarding sexual and physical abuse came out about him. Moreover, the nature of his alleged acts or kinks were considered so unusual and unlike the quote unquote regular practices of sexual assault that they were accepted by shock and confusion. To handle their shock, Twitter users prefer to joke about themselves and their reactions rather than critically reflect on the severity of Hammer's behavior. These jokes and memes allowed users to create a community that is morally superior and detached from such abnormal behaviors and kinks. Lastly, we want to reflect on the limitations of the findings we presented today and our thoughts for expanding on them. First of all, we explored the first two months after the story broke, perhaps the passing of time decreased the shock and made more room for critical discussions. Since stories about Hammer fluctuated with time, it would be interesting to examine if the narrative regarding his behavior shifted or changed as well. Another limitation is our sample size, which focused on tweets that received the most likes. It would be interesting to also examine tweets that received less traction and see if these are the tweets that we initially thought that we would find, more serious ones that discuss the, the line between kink and harassment. Thank you very much. You can follow us on Twitter for any updates on this work, uh, and we welcome any suggestions, feedback, or comments you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Neta and Jaime. Uh, your presentation is already giving rise to very interesting questions in the chat, which uh, we will return to at the very end uh, of this session. So uh, we now uh, turn to our second paper of the day, uh, re-articulating the idea of manosphere, WhatsApp groups as digital ideoculture. Uh, and uh, we have two co-presenters, Cosimo Marcos Carcelli, uh, who is a tenure track uh, assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy, Sociology, Education and Applied Psychology at the University of Padua, uh, and Cyrus Rinaldi, who's a senior lecturer in sociology of law, deviance, and social change uh, in the Department of Cultures and Societies at the University of Palermo in Italy. Uh, so Cosimo, Marco, and Cyrus, over to you. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for your introduction, Jose. I'm Marco Scarcelli from University of Padova, and I'm going to present my paper on rearticulating the idea of Menosphere, WhatsApp groups, and digital video culture. This is a part of a broader research on masculinity and digital media that I'm doing from 2020 for last year, and uh, the research focuses on everyday digital practices to understand if we can analytically rearticulate the manosphere. So the idea is, can we speak about the manosphere in a different way? Usually when we speak about manosphere, we speak about this, um, a field that have label, label boundaries. So um, this is described usually as a complex system of communities, groups, and platforms. So you probably know red, red pills or uh, pickup parties, etc. And uh, we see there are, these are spaces that are really uh, used and uh, frequented by young people in Italy. Uh, from our survey, young people don't know these kind of spaces, probably because of the language. But uh, um, my hypothesis is that uh, they use the content of Manosphere probably without knowing what they are using. Uh, just a few words about theoretical background. Uh, I st the starting point is uh, the gender the performance and uh, the importance of social and relational dimension for creating gender, for constructing gender, to, for performing gender. And I'm going to focus on, on social practices uh, between teens, of course, uh, where, where and when they do masculinities and they do that on digital spaces. And it is very important to me because there is a strong connection, as the previous research shows, between digital media, gender, and sexuality. And um, digital platforms are very interesting and important because are, they, are, they, um, they are spaces where produce, reproduce, and are challenging the so-called hegemonic masculinities. Masculinity, sorry. So the rest question is, how boys perform masculinity in private WhatsApp groups composed by men, in this case, heterosexual men? And connection, connected to this request question, there is another request, research question that is connect, like the connection between manosphere and the interaction with private groups. So the idea is 
the question is there is a connection between the private groups and the more uh, bo broad uh, space of manosphere. This is a research with youths and not on youths. I tried to use a youth centric approach involving 36 Italian boys between 15 and 19 years old from different regions in Italy. And I conducted a semi structured interview that, uh, of course, I transcribed the verbatim and then I analyzed with a thematic uh, analysis. So let's see what about the results of this research. Uh, all the interviews participate to private WhatsApp group composed by only by men. And this kind of group are uh, interesting and have a particular uh, form. They are composed by three, five people. So we are speaking about a very small group. It's very small groups composed by friends. And when I say friend, I, I mean schoolmates, people uh, that, they, that play football or basketball or whatever together mm, are people that know each other. And this is very important. This is very important because this kind of work is totally different from other, other, uh, other works, so for example, that focused on Telegram or that kind of we call a digital space. The boundaries are controlled by gatekeeper. So it means that if you want to enter that group, you have to uh, have an invitation or ask for, uh, to the, the people that compose the group. So a very, very private group. The, the young people said that in this, in this group, they speak about uh, um, things for men, or as the, the interviewee here say, and uh, they describe this kind of group as a classical group of friends, where, we, where they speak about sport, video game, jokes, and girls. And in, in, if we speak, we, if we have a look to the topics, we can uh, already see a, 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 a connection with Manosphere, of course. Um, this kind of group, uh, this WhatsApp group, works as almost social arena, where shared idea of masculinity defines habits and contents. I mean, they perform what uh, perform um, what what means to be a man, what means act as a man, and they perform their masculinity in front of specific and defined audience that is composed by their friend. This kind of space, uh, I have a symbolic delimitation, and uh, all all boys or all interviewees were uh, afraid about uh, that, um, a sort of invasion from adults or from girls, as you can say in this excerpt, the, this guy said, uh, if there was a girl, we wouldn't send them, it wouldn't be the same thing. So what it means it wouldn't be the same things, they define this kind of group as a group where, where, where sorry, they can, they could perform their masculinity. So what's a group works as community of practices and the definition of masculinity usually is in relation to femininity. This is another, to me, important um, things. Usually, uh, boys use the humor and um, uh, reproduce, to reproduce the hegemonic masculinity. And this kind of, um, okay, they say, we are, we're just joking in the chat. We are joking. We are not saying nothing against women or something like that. And this is a strategy of homosocial affiliation. And uh, um, they repeat, repeat again that lots of things are possible inside the group and is not possible outside the group. So they describe a society that mutes man's voice, uh, according to interviews, of, of course. And again, this is, a, a, to me, a strong connection with what Manosphere usually said. Also about the joke. Um, when we say we are joking, they take away from radical groups. So I ask for what about the group that in WhatsApp, in, for, in uh, Telegram, for example, used to share private images or used to offend girls. And they say, no, no, they are crazy. We are totally different. It's something different from what they, we do. But when we, we, analyze, we analyze the interview, we can find lots of connection, for example, in the contents of what they share. I mean, meme, I mean, uh, this kind of joke that I report here. So there is a sort of circulation of contents between manosphere and these kind of groups. When they say speaking about girls, um, they define something that they usually do in these kind of groups. And they spoke about jokes, comment about girls, never about emotive support. It seems that emotional um, support is something negative for them. They say, if I want to speak about that, I, I do with just with one friend and not in that 
a small group. Mm. Lots of time they spoke about this, what I, what, what I call the digital go watching. So they share images, share content about girls that they know. So we are not speaking about pornography. We are not speaking about uh, um, people, uh, famous people, but we are speaking about the girls that they already know. And uh, there is a, a, a creation of, sort of a sort of small dossier about uh, the, the content of that girl or that, one, that another girl. They do a lot of comments about girls that we that I um, divide in slash shaming. So they frequently judge the behavior of girls, for example, about a girl that show her in bikini or in other kind of dresses. And uh, uh, they also sharing uh, share sexual models. So they define all together what is an attractive body. So saying, oh, she's pretty now, she's better. So they define what the group um, decide, decide is, is uh, an active body. And there are also uh, uh, this other behavior that I call trophization, that is not something connected, connected to sexting or other, other behavior. It's just uh, to show to friends by the photo of a, of a girl that uh, one boy is dating with to show them you know, uh, which kind of cool girl, or cute girl uh, is, is going to have a beer, coffee, or whatever you want. Unfortunately, lots of discourses of, of, of a young man that I collected uh, are full of uh, rape culture and this kind of fantasies. I mean, lots of times they say, okay, for joke, I say that I want to do this with that girl or with another thing with another girl. And, and there are lots of, um, is a, 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 a strong matches of rape culture in their uh, discourses that they usually frame as joke, of course. So to go to, uh, to the conclusion, um, I can say that the monkey masculinity is reinforced inside digital environments and in this WhatsApp group, this, uh, this kind of, of masculinity, so hegemonic masculinity is, uh, is very strong and there are no other forms of hybrid masculinity, inclusive masculinity, so lots of, of uh, kind of masculinity that we can find in the literature in this kind of, of WhatsApp group are <laughs> not, not, does not exist. It's just a, a real um, strong way, a form of the of hegemonic masculinity. Private WhatsApp group, as I, as I said, works as community practices where young people could produce, reproduce, or negotiate what it means to be a man. So it's um, like when I say um, um, they produce and reproduce, I don't, just not with language, but also with image, with uh, sharing a uh, position about girl or not. Mm. They share artifacts, they share values, they share language. Mm. So the question that I, and is, the name, is the name of, of the presentation, I think that we can speak about digital ideal culture. As you probably know, fine 1987 spoke about ideal culture, speaking about a small group of young boy that uh, played uh, baseball. And that, well, that group was closed, so uh, they could uh, perform their masculinity in a specific group. And I think that WhatsApp group could be um, called as digital idiot culture because in this specific group, they define what masculinity is, they define their way to be a man and uh, without the, um, the menace of um, adult or uh, parents or girls, because they repeat again and again that uh, the, the WhatsApp group are spaces for real masculinity. Mm. They say we can be a man because outside people doesn't understand. They cannot understand that we are joke. We cannot understand that we are good people. If we say something about that girl or another girl, they just start to judge us. And this is, to, from my point of view, a very strong connection with Manosphere, because if we read the, the discourse of Manosphere lots of time, uh, the matrix is similar. So probably we can speak about a central Manosphere when we speak of, of a classical uh, definition of Manosphere, and lots of peripheral Manospheres that are connected to the central one and uh, uh, are full of contents of a central Manosphere, but that also uh, permit to young people to share with the center manosphere content. So there's a sort of circulation of contents that change their frame from central to peripheral because people, young people said, okay, it's different, it's a joke. 
it's, it's something that we frame with humor, but at the end, it's, it's the, the matrix is the same. So uh, to, conclude, to conclude, I think that is very, very important. It's totally important to focus on this kind of peripheral manospheres because um, it's like um, if they are the field where uh, more uh, violent and uh, stronger discourse grow up. And uh, so thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, um, Marco. I, I, I imagine that uh, Cirrus didn't make it. Uh, so uh, we will now continue on to our third and last uh, paper of this evening, uh, British lads hit each other with chair, uh, viewership, speculation, and uh, male affection. Uh, so Broderick Chow is reader and deputy dean at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama at the University of London. And Aero Lane is the Director of Graduate Studies and Assistant Professor in the Department of Theatre and Dance at the University of Buffalo. Uh, so uh, thank you very much and uh, we we'll await to hear from you. Um, thanks very much, everybody. I'm going to apologize in advance that my connection may be slightly unstable. I've been without Wi-Fi for the day and I'm on a, a cellular hotspot at the moment, but it's been holding up all day. So um, fingers crossed it <laughs> will continue. Um, we're slightly shifting gears, I, I think. Um, from a kind of more um, sociological um, theorization towards something much more um, within the humanities and talking about a particular uh, digital video as well as a digital art practice um, today. So I'm going to start um, sharing screen now and pass it over to Arrow. So. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll start with the thing. Okay. So um, there are plenty of videos online featuring men doing painful things to themselves and to each other. In 2016, YouTube video British lads hit each other with chair is on the surface, not much different. The title is an accurate description of the material, even as it doesn't capture the full depth of the matter. Or as YouTube commentator Ren notes, quote, the kiss at the beginning lets you know this is a great video. Turn around, you little fun. Oh, fuck it. Oh, oh they are. Major, major and breaks in one, yeah? Did you say what about, Lucy? You need to hit it hard. Hit it hard. Hit it hard so it breaks in one. All right, all right, all right. One last one. I'm going to get him on. End it, man. End it. Oh, yeah, fuck it. Yeah, come right, on. Right, I'm going to get him on. Hit it hard. 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 Don't get me in. Don't get me in. Oh, come on, then. All right. One, two, two three. Oh, <laughs> ah. No, we can't give it, man. I mean, I mean, you have to do it on the back, on the back, on the fucking. Shit, hell, man. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's <laughs> Great, we'll come back to that video in more in depth in a second. So in 2020, the video the game is changing. I know I come with a history that all of you love. I'm not going to get edged out. Oh, sorry, that's the autoplay on YouTube. <laughs> Um, in 2020, video game artist Robert Yang produced a playable interpretation of the video. In Yang's game, you play the part of the friend holding the camera, but also direct the action, making the hard and British lads kiss, drink, and yes, hit each other with a chair. Such an artistic strategy indexes the blurry lines of intimacy between fighting and loving in homosocial performances, and we argue opens new political and aesthetic relations and otherwise circumscribed social acts. The video and then the game trouble boundaries of violence and affection and prompts theoretical speculation over alternative forms of masculinity that they might embolden, even amidst seemingly traditional or hegemonic masculinity, that loud, large, and boorishly oblivious way of encountering the world that we refer to in our work as obvious masculinity. Yang's playable digital artwork 
plays with speculation and fabulation as part of what Eve Sedgwick might call a reparative project, using interactive aesthetics to work through the love for the original video and performance. So we interrogate the fascination with acts and gestures of affection, tenderness and love between men, and the concomitant framing or addition of violence as an element in these performances. And in doing so, we ask how speculative readings of documented homosocial performances can develop strategies that hold open the space of non-confirmation and examine the risks of such speculation in light of other speculative interests. What is wagered when we invest our interests in these hard lads as they drink, smoke, kiss, and injure each other? This paper is drawn from a larger book length project entitled Bros, Obvious Masculinity and Homosocial Performance. The book attempts to shift from categorical and typological analyses of masculinity to a relational analysis of masculine homosociality. So Eve Sedgwick's classic formulation of homosocial desire, which she says is, quote, the continuing continuum between men loving men and men promoting the interests of men is writ large with bros. By looking at the obvious, i.e. the plain and evident to mind, but also lacking in subtlety, banal, predictable performance of bros, we argue that those forms of masculinity that often manifest as hegemonic or toxic are best understood not as um, not through the lens of identity, but rather through homosocial performance. The project might be understood as a reparative reading of social relations or as opening speculative possibilities in what are otherwise too obviously toxic or troubling ways of performing masculinity. In their book, Female Masculinity, Jack Halversam works through the obviousness of masculinity itself, writing, quote, although we seem to have a difficult time defining masculinity, as a society, we have little trouble in recognizing it. For Halberstam, masculinity becomes legible as such when it is denaturalized, that is, when it's performed on or through other embodied identifications outside of white middle-class maleness. In a similar fashion, the bro, as a signifier of masculinity, comes into being relationally. What appears plain and evident to the mind as a masculine archetype is only understood through its relation to others both his bros as well as alternative forms of masculinities and other gender identities that a bro -y hierarchy subordinates and excludes. In doing so, we disentangle bros and a bro -y sense of relationality from the often white patriarchal behaviors that are often marked as bro. The book argues that bro is a relational category that might both trouble and reinscribe homosocial networks, aesthetics, and performance. Bro bonding then can be both and. In other words, we investigate performances of homosociality as a way of thinking past patriarchal masculinity as a monolith through that obvious figure of the bro. So before turning to our main example of British lads hitting each other with a chair, we return to what might be the most recent ur text of painful male bonding and what we refer to as jackass theory. The MTV show then movie franchise has held a disproportionate impact on performances of masculine pain, masochism and homosocial bonding over the past two decades through the self-inflicted violence of Johnny Knoxville and his crew who had little compunction around various scatological and painful acts performed for the camera. The MTV prank show encapsulates for many the various contradictions, troubles and even promises of contemporary masculinity since the late 1990s. Many have attributed the bonding afforded to a largely white cishet men of jackass to the masochism described by David Saverin in his book, Taking It Like a Man, when he traces a genealogy of masochistic white American masculinity from the beat poets till Sylvester Stallone's Rambo and the Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. Saverin writes, quote, a male protagonist takes up the role of victim, usually with deep ambivalence, and struggles against a fierce opponent to prove his toughness, vigor, and masculinity." End quote. Or as Halberstam would have it writing around the same time, considering the boxing film Raging Bull, quote, masochism is built into male masculinity, and the most macho of spectacles is the battered male body, a bloody hunk of ruined flesh stumbling out of the corner for another round, end quote. For Finton Walsh, uh, it is precisely the masochism of jackass 
uh, flecked with blood and fecal matter that functions like an apex of Sedgwick's erotic triangle, giving the male subjects access to homosocial relations which are intimate and sometimes erotic and are, he concludes, ultimately aggressive enough to avoid entering the domain of the homosexual. And in the end, it performs a quote, law sustaining and male privileging masochistic relationship. This seems evident in the intense navigation of affection and violence in Jackass. And indeed in many of the videos posted to YouTube of men in backyard wrestling matches, engaging in dangerous pranks, and yes, lads hitting each other with chairs. In these performances, both tenderness and masochism perhaps shore up a phallic power in patriarchal relations. In Not Gay, Sex Between Straight White Men, Jane Ward notes that, quote, white male performers are arguably more likely than male performers of color to think they can appear on screen as themselves, as opposed to appearing in character, engaged in acts of personal humiliation, intimate homosexual touching, and full body exposure without severe consequences for their career and reputations. And yet, she continues, in discussing Jackass, Quote, at the same time, Knoxville and Steve-O's white male jackassery also models a way for young white men to disidentify with knee-jerk homophobia of, the gener of their generation. Masochism is somewhere in this triangle of desire and in forging homosocial bonds that might both reinforce patriarchal relations and undo them, but perhaps the real impact of jackass is in shifting that third point of the Sedgwickian triangulation from a love interest shared by two men or a shared sense of masochism and rather to the camera, to the audience or at least the imagined audience. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Johnny Knoxville redirects a question about the pain of being hit in the groin from an inquiry about his testicles to discuss his penis saying, quote, I broke my penis about three years ago trying to backflip a motorcycle. It looks like a sock that's lost its elasticity. You know, the kind that droop around your ankles? That's what my penis looks like. This anatomical evasion from the locus of testicular pain to an evocative image of Knoxville's floppy penis marks, we think, a larger shift in relations where the phallic might be outdone by the penis itself. So rather than describe or relish in masochistic testicular pain, Knoxville encourages the reader to imagine the visual effects of the actions. The apex of the Sedgwickian triangle is therefore not the act of masochism itself, but rather the camera lens and the imagined viewer that sits beyond it. In an interview, Knoxville explains that he doesn't have a death wish. He says, quote, we're just doing stupid stuff to make ourselves laugh, just want to get good footage, end quote. The lads or the bros or the jackasses are playing out homosocial fantasies for a speculative bro on the other side of the camera. When asked if God, him or herself might find pleasure in a good punch in the nuts gag, Bam Margera, another member of the jackass troupe replies, uh, quote, of course, yeah. I mean, if you don't find humor in that, then you're dumb. After a pause, he continues, I mean, we're dumb, not God. We're the ones getting punched in the balls. He's the one just enjoying it. He probably wouldn't enjoy it if it was happening to him, but he'd probably like to watch us do it to somebody else, end quote. The speculative audience, real or spiritual, is a jackass. So by watching jackass, we're all jackasses together. We're all bros now. So we've perhaps painted ourselves into a bit of a theoretical corner. If what we've claimed is not true, then it's really just a bunch of hard lads and jackasses. And worse, we're reinscribing and reifying patriarchy and masculinist politics and aesthetics. But that is the gambit or the risk of speculative theoretical work, which is to say the safer bets might be ascribed to a sort of masculine masochistic power by Halberstam, Saverin, or Walsh, or on the other end of the spectrum, Brian Pronger's reading of the homoerotics of sport and the fascination with male uh, athletic signifiers in gay porn. To be clear, we don't think that these readings are necessarily incorrect. Indeed, they're probably more likely to hold up across time and more examples. Saverin, Walsh, and Halberstam haven't provided investment grade readings of these actions and phenomena. However, our speculative work with these lads, these bros, is that their odd and violent homosocial performance opens up new possibilities and relations.
And here we distinguish speculation, which implies transaction from its methodological cousin, fabulation. Speculation relates to risk and the potential of accrued value. And here we have this sort of bro uh, image of how to understand speculation. A speculative investment is short-term, very risky, with potential for both immense growth and also immense loss, often relying not on the inherent value um, of the thing that's invested in, but on fluctuation in price. In other words, speculation produces or loses value through the deferral of its realization. A speculative reading then is not simply fictional or fabulated, but a high stakes wager that carries considerable risk, value to be lost or gained. In the case of the specific forms of bro-y homosocial masculinity that we analyze in our project, the stakes of our speculative methodology are high because they could be undone so easily. In other words, we recognize that this project, we are putting a lot of work into what is potentially a bad investment. Why devote so much academic theorizing and labor to a one minute and eight second video of mindless drunk violence? Well, for nothing less than the possible return of a better future. We argue the online audience of British lads is making a similar wager. Comments on the original YouTube video demonstrate the degree to which audience investment in the video was driven by acts of care, tenderness, pleasure, and eroticism in the midst of mindless but consensual violence. The homoerotic dimension of the video and the state of undress of the lead players aside, many viewers pointed to the loving care shown in the video's final moments as chair lad cradles hit with chair lad in a pose resembling, according to commentators, Herbert Draper's 1898 painting, The Lament for Icarus. The independent video game Hard Lads by games designer and academic Robert Yang builds on this audience response. In his artist statement, Yang writes, like many people around the world, I really love this video. I've watched it hundreds of times, paused countless freeze frames to examine the most trivial of details. And at this point, I've written thousands upon thousands of words about it. It has problems, it has beauty. It's a complex piece of culture that merits our attention. If love is a form of magic, then I am a magical sea nymph recovering Icarus from the boy blue ocean. I perform this spell in the centuries old tradition of queering, end quote. Yang's musing on love pulls hard lads into the orbit of what Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick calls a reparative practice. So here we'll play a little bit of what the video game looks like um, with the sound off. Um, and Sedgwick defines a reparative practice as, quote, the many ways selves and communities succeed in extracting sustenance from the objects of a culture, even of a culture whose avowed desire has not been to sustain them. Evoking queering as a methodology, Yang draws on the established connection between queer theory and speculative or science fiction, um, particularly in Afrofuturist and queer of color works of fiction. Yang's digital artwork applies this tradition of queer world making to the documented performance of, in his words, straight mate energy, intersection, intersected with positions of whiteness and working class northernness. He writes, Quote, the video shows how straight mate energy is actually quite fragile. It takes just one minute to utterly destroy the lad's masculinity on video. In the end, I argue that queer love is also the force that honors masculine vulnerability. And so only we have the power to reclaim these lads, end quote. Yang intends to map potential solidarities between white working class communities and LGBT activism, which are also historical realities forgotten by mainstream histories. The speculative readings of British lads are played and played out in the video game. What is obvious to us is made interactive. The speculation is realized. Um, arrow over over to you. Oh, sure. Have I, have I lost connection? Yeah. You have it. Okay, yeah. Um, in the engine of the game, the player takes on the role of the friend holding the camera phone. Via the movement of the phone, the player can make the boys kiss, drink, smoke, and of course, hit each other with chairs. Yang notes that this choice was driven by his interpretation of the lad's actions. Quote, it is this phone camera gaze that drives the lads to perform. 
They're only doing this because their mates are watching them. In order, in giving over control to the spectator player, Yang realizes the speculative potential of the original video, but in doing so, potentially diminishes its value. The player can emphasize the violent or erotic dimensions of the performance as desired, confirming their own speculative reading. Where Yang's own speculative investment lies, in, uh, lies is demonstrated by his alteration of the video's ending. Whereas British Lads uh, ends with a gentle, if ridiculous, act of care, Hard Lads, the video game, moves towards more obviously fabulative territory. The lad being hit emerges from a pile of chairs that have rained from the sky. The body of the shirtless Icarus floats prone into the sky past the roofs of the Sink estate where other shirtless men emerge to serenade his ascent with a chorus of savage gardens, truly, madly, deeply. The fabulated ending is both more loving and maybe less risky. A beautiful image whose distance from reality polices the audience's excitement about speculation. Paradoxically, via that speculation being realized for, an, for the audience in a tender sing-along that might be surprising in light of the violence of the video, but also would not be an uncommon sight at a local pub. Thus, in the end, the speculative possibilities of this artwork are constrained by its fabulation. Players of the game are free to explore a number of options as the gameplay allows one to instruct the lads to strike or kiss each other from the vantage of the male gaze of the camera phone. However, to continue playing in any way funnels you into particular fabulative readings that resolve and are realized in set pieces that echo existing scenes of male bonding. But perhaps even more important to our speculative jackass inflected bro reading is that the lads themselves in the original video aren't compelled by the camera, but are playing to it, playing with it, desiring it together. To exclusively attribute the queer aspects of this video to audience speculation is to deny the agency that the lads themselves have in playing with queer touch, pleasure, and male-male affection. Sedgwick reminds us, quote, the desire of a reparative impulse, on the other hand, is additive and accretive. Its fear, a realistic one, is that the culture surrounding it is inadequate or inimical to its nature. It wants to assemble and confer plenitude on an object that will then have resources to offer to an incohate self. So if we're not ready to understand the British lads video, that's no fault of the lads. It is rather that we are, to recite uh, Sedgwick, inadequate or inimical to their nature. Like any performance, the lads are performing for an audience, both their fully clothed bros and the imagined gaze of the internet audience for which it is being filmed. The audience is both what mediates and diminishes the queer dimension of the performance, as well as what prompts it. The embodied knowledge, desire, pleasure, and affection is known to the lads, but not experienced by the audience, except that it calls to the viewer to engage in their own speculative behavior to get together with friends, kiss them, and hit them with chairs. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Broderick and uh, uh, Aero. I'm sure there are lots of questions. There's already been quite a few uh, questions uh, uh, in the chat. Um, does anyone want to start? All right. Um, John, you had a very uh, interesting point about uh, performativity uh, in uh, the Army Hammer uh, paper. Do you want to uh, bring it up or shall I? No, no, I, no, no, I can um, talk about it, Jose. Thanks, everybody. Um, three really great papers. I think one of the strain, one of the um, kind of surprises and treats of organising a conference is when you pull papers together, sometimes you don't know whether they're going to work particularly well. And in actual facts, there has been a, a, th a, a thread running all the way through this. And these papers do talk to each other in ways that I certainly couldn't have anticipated. So that's great. Um, hi, me and Netta. I've got kind of a question or comment to you about um, the way in which humor is used on Twitter. Um, 
but also the way in which people perform um, offence and outrage. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering about the extent to which the research that you've done so far is taking very literally what um, Twitter users are saying, rather than thinking through um, the, um, their performative register, the, the, um, the modalities of outrage or offence or shock or humour that they're performing. In, in essence, the question, I'm, the question I'm asking you is, are, are you accepting unquestionably what people say on Twitter or are you um, re re reading it through a filter of something else? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. And thank you very much for all the other presentations. I really enjoyed all of them. Um, yeah, it's something that we started thinking about, uh, especially because we focused on the ones that received the most likes. So obviously, people were trying to, to perform something to get to get you know to get likes to get recognition and um and that's exactly why we're, we want to include other tweets that did not get the same traction and see if they are in any way different um and as we said maybe more critical and the second part yes obviously we don't take um take these tweets at, at face value but still we found that the humor here was different from other cases um as we said in other um, research that was done about other Me Too cases that did use humor, it was usually anti-feminist humor. It was against the victims, um, as we said, who is who deserves. Uh, sorry, it's a terrible thing to say, but who deserves to be to be part of a sexual abuse and who does not deserve to be part of it, um, in terms of um, their uh, physical attraction. Um, and here again, it was as if the act itself is not a problem. It's as, it, it, it's still treated Army Hammer as as a sex symbol. Um, there were a lot of people saying, "Oh, I want Army Hammer to eat me," um, and things like that. And that is definitely not something that we've seen with other cases. Um, yeah, so it's definitely an avenue that we will continue to research um, because we do want to include more tweets and see if if there's um, other kinds of discourses that we missed when focusing on those top 100. Do you want to add something? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think um, that's that's very true. Um, the idea of performance, perhaps very similar to what um, Cosimo uh, has said, it's it's interesting, but even when we see these as performances, we need to start asking, why are they performing shock at these acts and not outrage at the fact that Armijan was allowed to get away with this or outrage at the impact on his career? So there's a degree to which, even if this is at the performance layer, um, it still plays into the politics of humor. And none of the tweets that we analyzed became viral tweets. We're not talking about tweets with millions of likes or anything. Um, but we need to look, as we said, the limitations further into uh, the longer term, perhaps comparing how uh, this course changed over time. Uh, if it did, who knows? Maybe it didn't. Thank you. Osta, we have you both, Neta and Jaime, on screen. I was wondering whether you considered the response on Twitter to his star persona. Yeah, kind of beginning from the social network. I, he is seen as Mr. Rich and Mr. Bland and Mr. Wasp, right? And I wonder how that uh, structured, you know, the the kind of humor about, you know, yeah, all of a sudden this bland person becomes Mr. Cannibal. And I wonder if you'd considered that. Um, I guess I can start because there was a, a, a beautiful uh, BuzzFeed article that was written about Army Hammer a few years ago um, that started a bit a big beef between him and uh, the journalist who wrote the paper, which is basically she said that she doesn't understand why he's famous uh, or why he keeps getting roles because he's very mediocre in everything. <laughs> um, even in his looks um, and he got very angry. And I think that was the starting point of social media starting to scrutinize him a lot more. Um, and also women starting to be very suspicious of him because there's something that looked a bit off 
especially with the way that he um, uh, uh, handled this whole uh, controversy surrounding him. Um, and I do have to say that when Jaime and I started um, thinking about this research, um, our Twitter feeds were very different because we follow very different people in very different communities. And I had a lot of feminist outrage <laughs> on my feed, whereas uh, Jaime had a lot of like gay humor uh, type of uh, feed that going on. So that was also interesting, again, in terms of women being already kind of suspicious of him and kind of critical of him um, and gay Twitter still celebrating him because he's very sexy. I do also follow feminist accounts from time to time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I do think that that impression of Army Hammer, it's very dependent on the community um, you're talking about. So as Neta said, there are communities that distrust him, but there are others that for a long time have, particularly since Come By Your Name, have intensely stalked every single like that he's given across social media and have found that he's into BDSM. That was a well-established fact before this happened. So kind of this was like accumulation of interest um, or facts that became very interesting for different communities for different reasons. Um, so it's it was kind of a perfect storm in which these messages sparked the interest of feminist accounts, of uh, you know incels and people saying that he was being targeted and gay um, accounts who were really into eroticizing him so it was yeah perfect storm coming all together around him okay thank you both very much uh we now have a question from jason you want to take over hey uh thanks all the papers i they were fantastic um and i feel like i have many questions for everyone but this one is for uh broderick and arrow um and maybe also relevant for cosmos paper on the manosphere um start my video okay so I, I guess i'm interested in this in this notion of the bro as a reparative space or sort of a sympathetic space and um and, and sort of the fine line of where the bro is troubling and where it's where it's kind of victimized um and so i'm thinking of, of two things like one is uh, there's a a forum on reddit that is called shit on me sunday which is every week these guys just criticize each other's physiques and whether you know their elbows are pointy or their legs are small um and but it always strikes me as a sort of nurturing space too in a weird way um but i'm also thinking of how with like incel culture the bro is a hated figure like the chad the chad represents like the bro the muscular bro and they're like public enemy number one, like the chads need to be destroyed. Um, and, and the bro is like so often vilified, right? The second something becomes a bro, a tech bro is associated with gentrification. A Bernie bro is associated with like a mansplaining leftist. So like now I'm kind of rambling, like where, where is the line between like a troubling bro and this like open space for sympathy, empathy, or maybe yeah, nurturing love support. Um, yeah, that's a um, that's a great question, and I think um, it might. I think the answer to this might respond to some of um, also John's questions and and yours too in the chat regarding class and like what is the kind of demarcated line between a lad culture and a bro culture. I think that one of the things that we're trying to do with this project is to build on I think the kind of multiplicity that you've just described actually in terms of bro as this appellation to just like any sort of behavior to market as like a vilified thing but also potentially um potentially elitist and, and club-like and 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 indexed to a kind of like normative and hegemonic form of masculinity but 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 it seems like endlessly developing and um and without like trying to discount the the sort of role that class and geography and um, and other identitarian categories of actually race and other sorts of forces play within this. I think what we're trying to tease out here is similar forms of practices and performance that lead to certain things being demarcated as bro-y or bro-like. Bro and just to, uh, to give like a kind of quick example of this is that um, 
another chapter that we have is regards um, Asian bros and like the representation of, of specifically within TV shows of a kind of bro -y type of Asian uh, the straight Asian masculinity, which on the surface of it, you can read as a kind of like um, a, a form of recuperation through its proximity to whiteness. Um, but actually within certain performances and the way in which those form performances then circulate again to the digital sphere where you have like the TikTok videos of like Asian guys doing, create actually creating for themselves like the Kevin Nguyen's stereotype, like that then like transforms and molds itself away from something that is an externally validated form of, of of, of culture that is recognizes a kind of singular identity towards something that is created through uh, a social uh, uh, forms of practices of relations. So I think that um, to answer your question, I think that the line between like the troubling bro and the, um, the kind of nurturing one is kind of precisely what we're interested in and we're not really the, trying to resolve it i think we're actually interested in sitting with that dialectic and, and that discomfort actually as what the the bro does as a figure Thank you very much. uh any further questions i can't see any hands up uh well uh marco i, I I have a question uh, for you. Um, I was, you know, there's, there was an incident in my, the university I worked for, which was very similar to this, right? But in which there were threats of rape that were then rendered public, right? And the women were absolutely shocked, you know, by what these men whom they knew were saying about <laughs> raping them. And, of course, all the students were subsequently uh, uh, kicked out of uh, the university and so on. But it made me think, you know, it's very much related to the kind of, you know, to your project. And I wondered both about, you know, the, the place of the relation between the public and private sphere, yeah, of all of this, and then kind of, you know, its relation as the public sphere as some place that feminism has rendered so woke that men can't be themselves. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's one of the points of research. I mean, uh, this idea to be in a private space but they create between friends, but also uh, it's not totally private because uh, um, I jumped to a methodological quest, um, stuff. I mean, when I asked them to, to tell me about what they say, but they, was, they feel totally free to see mm -hmm. everything, no? So uh, at the starting point, I say, okay, let's try. I want to say, want to know what they are going to say to me, but they open the door immediately, but because I'm a man, of course. So they um, think that, okay, you're a man, so you uh, absolutely, you are, you're in line with my ideas. So I can speak with you about that, there is no problem. So this is a, a important cultural things because uh, this idea of masculinity, they, they probably think that is um, uh, shared between other men. Mm -hmm. So, but probably if, if I was a, a girl, they stopped immediately. Mm -hmm. So of course they, they find um, a private space. So they repeat a lot of the time that this is a private space where no one could enter, no one could ask things, no one could uh, spy or uh, share this kind of idea. But uh, this kind of private space is not uh, totally yeah. private, I mean. And the, the good thing is that, uh, another good point is that uh, when we speak about uh, someone that entering the group, they super immediately start to say, ah, oh, no, no, the other people cannot understand. And if a girl listen or read what, what I wrote, probably I'm not chance with her because they frame me like uh, no, uh, uh, a crazy man or a violent man because they can, could not understand. We are speaking about uh, different things. So they have not the frame to understand what uh, we, we say. And uh, to me, it is uh, very, very important because uh, uh, I used to do project in the school year in Italy to speak about this stuff with uh, young people. And uh, I think that we have to start to, from their point of view, of course. So uh, usually when we start to j joke about these uh, topics, I never stop saying, oh, what are you saying? No, 
I cannot say something uh, rude like them, but I follow the discourse and when and then we try to deconstruct this kind of discourse because other, otherwise to me, the risk is that they want to uh, uh, cover or they want to hide this secret group, private group. So the, the idea of private and public is important because we have to put in the public this kind of discourse to deconstruct them. Of course, we have to uh, teach, speak with them and uh, help them to understand the, the violence that is, it is in, 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 um, in this kind of world. But the, the problem is that usually they do not, they not recognize this kind of violence because they frame this like it's just a joke uh, between friends. And in, in one hand, it's true because usually the, the people then at 35, 47, 30, become incel or become you know, really violent against women are not all the people because <laughs> so probably something happened in the mid in the in the in the, in the path i mean so if it's something is very connected to what we are uh, we spoke about uh, with john before so uh, the class uh, the, the instrument the cultural instruments that they could have so probably some of them could find someone that speak about uh, uh, what means to be a man in a different way, other no. Someone start to hate feminism just because they think that they want to leave them right. Someone else know someone that explain them what uh, feminism is, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of dimension, private and public, to me is also important for the intervention on this kind of topic. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I, I would like maybe to, to connect, if I may, uh, one of your concepts, Marco, what you were talking about the, the, the trophyization yeah, that takes place in this you know, digital manosphere um, to, to Broderick and, and Eros' presentation. Uh, and these are some of the points that John brought up about uh, you know, the, the, the performativity in the video that is not just the performativity of a particular type of masculinity, but it is also a, a, a performativity of class. And I was just wondering about the distinctions that John made in the chat between the bro and the lad, yeah, and these different understandings of what, of, or these different readings culturally located perhaps of what we saw in the initial video. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts or if John wanted to, to come in uh, and raise further questions. If I'm making sense, yeah. you are making sense. I'm glad you you've raised it. I I I think there's there's something that's very interesting in what Broderick and Eero are proposing, and I can see the connections they they're drawing. And um, I really enjoyed listening to Jason talking about the various um, very kind of. Um, granular but really culturally specific ways in which um, the conversation about the bro takes place in America and how important those cultural specifics are and I think the cultural specifics of contemporary white working class masculinity are also really really important so you know I'm slightly wary about this idea of rolling the lad into a discourse about bro culture when you know there's there's a lot of nuance that gets lost along the way there but I, I you know I accept the point that you're making that this isn't um um a categorical study in, in in that kind of way I think the thing that really kind of resonated with me was looking at the um the, the game design and the way in which the game design imposed a narrative on the video that wasn't in the original video and then extended that to a fantasy. Um, it, re it really struck me how, yet again, class plays this very, very important part in thinking through the way in which people are looking at people of, dif of a different social class um and objectifying them to use a term that i've got all sorts of problems with but objectifying them um and how it kind of it, it made me think of, of 
you know, kind of Edwardian and Victorian fantasies around working class masculinity and that there was something authentic and beautiful because it was um, unspoilt in some kind of ways that completely disregard the kinds of um, the social realities, the social conditions of those people um, and, and mute their voice too. And I think uh, one, one of the things that's very important for me, um, not just because my class origin is working class, there'll be other people in this room that that's also true of, um, that, that that kind of objectification and muting of people of a different class origin it, it kind of it strikes a it strikes a, a, a flat note with me. Yeah, um, thank you for the note about the muting in the video. I mean, part of that is our muting, but the the video does have music that plays over. Sure. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, that's a that's a excellent point in that. Um, but this also points to a little bit. I I love this to the the. the class markers, but also the difference between sort of this American fratty bro that is sort of conjured. Um, but we're, I mean, I, we are, and I think we're, we're working towards this with bro we in some ways, um, a way the sort of like category of bro, right? Like, okay, so board shorts, check, bro, like IPA, beer, check, bro, like sort of moving away some of that um, and looking at I mean, so Jason has a pretty good list in the chat, like the tech bro, the Bernie bro, all this sort of stuff. Um, and sort of, I mean, it, it, we think the, the figure of the bro, um, it either indexes everything that's quote unquote toxic about masculinity as such, right? If you apply, you know, this is a bro-y thing, um, then it's, bad, right? But it also, I think, asks us to um, start to push some, like, or ask pretty serious questions about the boundaries of affiliation um, when it comes to, like, who is or who can be a bro and what it is to be a bro. And this is where, um, you know, we're, we're moving around this in terms of uh, performance as opposed to costuming and, and that, right? But I, I wonder, um, you know, taking our sort of speculative methodology, I wonder how we might, um, you know, I mean, I'm thinking we might, you know, whatever, but like how we might make that connection between lads and bros, like, do they recognize each other as bros? If you put the uh, surfer bros in the same room as these lads, like, um, I, you know, but they that's what but that's what brings with theirs, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what brings me back to class zero because mm -hmm. the class the class origin of these groups is really, yeah. really radically different. Um, mm -hmm. When you when you're talking about the lads, the lads in that video who who are from Stoke on Trent or Derby, um, somewhere in the northeast <clears throat> Midlands, by the sounds of their accents, um, that is white. They are white working class young men um and they have nothing to do with um you know fraternities and middle class americanness i think they would find you know i can't speak for them of course i can't speak for them but i think i, I think they would struggle to see the um the connection and vice versa actually i don't think the the middle class college educated american boys would recognize very much I, <laughs> I themselves think, in those 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 lads either although i, I think, think, I, I think the, we we have a rubric in the uk and and a set of pejorative terms to describe those people chav of course has become out of fashion as a term a, 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 not least because it's an incredibly derogatory term but chav would have been the term that would have been used to describe those boys 10 years ago maybe yeah. The, so I think, you know, they, they, I don't think that they would probably be, you know, recognized uh, in terms of, they don't share a class position with like the kind of fratty university bro, but they, they might, 
one might argue very geographically different they might share a class position with like young vietnamese like houston texan bros you know so the you know children of immigrants and and working class vietnamese bros in in those communities so i think that i mean there are different gradations where there is that kind of class uh, intersection that um, we could see across the the different um, group, the different you know performances that we're looking at. But I think the one thing that it probably um, important to say is that ultimately this project is not like it's not about lad culture, it's not about bro culture, it's it's not about any of these. And because there are there are kind of enough books about that, you know, there's the the you know Connell's work on surfers in Australia is very you know kind of hints at a bro culture, but we're not really interested in actually looking at the boundaries of any one of these as kind of real things, but actually it's a book about performance and it's a book about the type about the, the fascination with certain types of performance that is in the air right now. And one of those things that is kind of particular, I think is the, the um, is it, it goes back to Jason's formulation of it as between troubling and nurturing and the way in which there, you know, this, this video, is what you know was taken up for its nurturing nature um but also has like the kind of intense fascination with violence as part of it which we make connections to you know work like deviates enter achilles the dance theater piece which is a kind of exploration of this and and uh, mixed martial arts fights and 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 I would say that, like the you know the the boys in this video are not unaware of that the fascination. They're playing. This is what we're kind of getting at that they're playing towards that that same audience. So ultimately, well, they've, they've got the chair from pro wrestling, haven't they? It's that idea. It's, pro wrestling. It's, I, I actually think it's a, a scene in The Simpsons that it comes yeah. from because pro yeah. wrestling is a steel chair. In The Simpsons, is a wooden one. <laughs> <laughs> If I can pick up from that, because, you know, this thing about, you know, troubling versus nurturing that you're quoting, Jason is saying, I mean, yeah, I love your discussion and you, br you brought up so many points about the masochism and the sex and the tenderness and the humor. But one of the things that struck me again, you know, and maybe this is just a UK thing, was a very strong sense of community. Yeah, that this was a ritual of hardness to belong to a group. Right. Uh, so and I, I mean, you know, I don't know enough about bro culture. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it strikes me as, uh, as you know, maybe a, a place where kind of community uh, might not be as, um, as, as potent as these working class rituals, or, or it might be. Yeah, but I thought kind of I, I would welcome, you know, a discussion of, of, of that notion that seems to me very powerfully evoked in the film. I don't know if you have any thoughts. <laughs> No. Yeah, I mean, well, I think this is the, the I, I, yeah, I mean, I think this is what sort of holds together maybe our definition of bro, right? So again, it's, it's not the sort of typology of a certain kind of masculinity or even ways of performing masculinity, but rather it is a, it's, um, the, the bro is relational. Um, and I mean, this is, this is sort of how out of, um, sort of to our, our idea of this sense of obviousness, perhaps, uh, because bros seem to recognize other bros and hail them as bros. Hey, bro, what's up, bro? Um, so there's the sort of like calling in. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'll leave it there. But yeah, I mean, it, it, you you can't have a, a singular bro, I guess, is where I'm getting at. Yeah. yeah so the I, I suppose that you know when Jason was asking about the incel culture, that's like because you can't. You can't have bros without friends. Like, there's no you, you. That's like the one kind of definition that you need. You need you need to have friends to be to to be a bro. But um, but incels in the manosphere um, that they, they have friends, right? And so this is where we get into the quite sticky thing of like what there there's broness in that in incel culture, like fundamentally because there 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 is that kind of homosocial sharing of of knowledge and affection and all of these different things. It's just like towards what you know towards what sort of troubling end. All right. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, are there any last questions? I don't see any. Feel free to intervene if there are. Otherwise, I, I just need to thank you all very much. It was a, a great uh, session.
uh, to end with, uh, giving us lots to think about. And I hope you all return with us uh, tomorrow at two. Thank you all very much.